In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I was a young kid, uh, I was visiting a, uh, a family of friends of our family. And I couldn't help but gaze upon what was on their wall in the kitchen. And it was a very fancy embroidered piece with a very nice frame, I remember, a nice wooden frame. And it said, bless this mess. And it didn't make any sense to me at all. I, I, was, I was raised to clean up my mess. But it made no sense to bless this mess. But I understood it as I got older what it meant, I think, as we all have. Today, we commemorate a period of time in the church in, in which it was a mess. The year was 325, and the priest Arius was running amok, uh, st going all over the place, spreading his diabolical teaching uh, that Christ is not God. Christ was just a mere man, a creature of God, with power, but a creature. And it was spreading through the church like wildfire. And it was, we think we have problems today at times, with various things that happen in the church is nothing compared to what was taking place back then. The church was literally torn in pieces. Constantine, the emperor, saw this. Now, he, his intention also was as a way to unify the empire, but he felt that a council was warranted to address this issue. It's also interesting to note that God has this wonderful tendency to take a mess and turn it into something glorious. That's what he does. And he did it in this case, too. And so they assembled a group of 318 bishops in a place called Nicaea. And if, if we walk into the hall during their deliberations, we can see the various members of this community gathered together, uh, holding within themselves, within themselves, but also externally, the wounds of persecution. Because these were men who experienced persecution when it was at its worst height. And so we had bishops with eyes plucked out, we had bishops with, you know, that were maimed, burned, various examples of torture. So they're gathered together in this place. And they see now we have to do something about it. But as it, as it seems, whenever people gather together, 318 of them, you know, it's not exactly, you know, some systematic, you know, it flow, going with the flow, everything's going great, and we'll come up with this wonderful conclusion, and we'll make a statement. No, it was a mess, because Arius was there. And so Arius was, kept sprouting his, his, his stuff, and Nicholas, St. Nicholas, was there, along with St. Athanasius and St. Spiridon. And Nicholas is hearing all this. And Arius is going on and on and on and on. Finally, Nicholas could not take any more of this. So he goes up to Arius and belts him, punches him in the nose, which is unseemly for a bishop to do that for someone who is, you know, attending this. The bishop summarily then say, you know, Nicholas, you have to leave. You, you, don't, you don't punch people out just because they disagree with you. Hey, we'll, we'll settle this, but... So they banished Nicholas from the chamber. And they kind of sequestered him in another area. And one of the leaders of the council later on received a vision and said, Nicholas is all right. <laughs> that was the heavenly vision. He said, Re reinstate him. And obviously it's not advocating, you know, punching someone out if they agree with us. But this is an indication that even heaven knew that this was a very important deliberation going on. And this and the future of the church, the foundation of the church depended upon making sure 
that the teaching of the divinity of Christ was solid. And that's why heaven gave a pass to Nicholas for his behavior that day. And then Nicholas was reinstated. We see how the Lord acts in our life. As we know, we have the teaching in the church called synergy, where we do our part and God completes what is lacking. He does that. That's the promise that he gives us. If we look back at the gospel today, the prayer that Jesus offered to the Father, all these prayers that the Lord was offering to his Father pointed to us, that we may be one as you and I, Father, are one, that you may be with them, to abide with them, to be with them, that that we will establish a relationship that will be so solid that they'll have nothing to be afraid of anymore because we are in them and they are in us. It's a very powerful gospel because we have to remember that Jesus was not just talking about his apostles being one and all, you know, as you and I, Father, are one. He was talking about us. He was talking about our lives being in union with God. And so when the Council of Nicaea then formulated the creed in which we proclaim every Sunday to the world and among us as a community of faith, we, we are reminded how important that the liberation was because then everything falls into place in our, in our life, in our spiritual walk. Because we know then that the prayer that Jesus taught his Father was a prayer offered by the man God, Jesus Christ. And that as he took on our humanity, in effect he also united his humanity with divinity. And so we become one with divinity. I mean, it's, it's so powerful. But we thank the, the fathers of the church back in those days who helped formulate this. And once again, the, the deliberations were messy. But God entered into the deliberations in the Council of Nicaea and made it right. And that's how God does it. He, even, he allowed heresy to take place, not to let the false teachings go on and on and on, but as an opportunity to teach the right things. So he took heresy and said, he presented that to the world in a sense, as heresy was spreading, false teachings about God, and he used even that opportunity to clarify who God is in our life. And we owe it to these men who back in the 325, who was able to lay that foundation for us. And so today, we're reminded one final thing, and that is, you know, we are also called to be ambassadors of Christ. When people see us, they see the church. When we proclaim to be Christian, they look at us, and they're, they're watching us sometimes, more often than not than we think, I think, and say, you know, are they practicing what they believe? Are they practicing the faith? It's very interesting how we have this responsibility in the world to be Christ in the world and to be ambassadors of the church in this world. And we know the wonderful effect that that has. Because even in pagan Rome, when they looked at the Christians in these various little communities, and the one remark they would make was, see how they love one another. And that was an attraction for people. And that is how Christianity built up, through the action of the Holy Spirit and also through the actions of those people who were called to Christ, by Christ, to be Christ. And so let us today rejoice and be glad that we have been called for that mission. And we ask the Lord to send his divine grace to us in whatever we do, that as we continue to try to follow Christ,
that God will always send his divine grace to complete what is lacking and to make it complete. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind always, now and ever, and on to the ages of ages.